So good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on uh, where in the world you are. Uh, we're real excited today to be telling you about a new product that we're about to release called Sear for Space. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking about that uh, as we proceed here. I'm going to do this in about four topics. Uh, I'm going to give you just a very quick overview of Galerith Inc. And to, uh, if you're not familiar with the company or to uh, remind you of uh, who we are. Uh, I'll just mention uh, the other products that we have that uh, some of your users for many years uh, of other SEER models, cost models. Then we'll spend the balance of our time, the preponderance of our time here today, talking about SEER space and uh, giving you a demo of this new model. A little bit about uh, Galarith. Uh, Galarith has been in business for over three decades now, uh, developing solutions to help both government and commercial entities uh, plan and manage their complex projects. They introduced their first cost model, which happened to be SEER SIM, SEER for, SEER for Software Estimating, uh, back in the late 80s. Followed that very quickly uh, a few years later with uh, SEER H, uh, SEER for Hardware. I've been a SEER H user since the mid-1990s, as a matter of fact. Uh, so our activities include uh, developing these parametric tools, uh, implementing those at, at, within your organization, which includes giving you training in the products. And increasingly, we're doing a lot of uh, professional cost analysis and consulting in Galera. Uh, and we also occasionally develop parametric uh, cost tools uh, customized for, for some of our customers. We kind of pride ourselves on having an intuitive interface for our models, uh, extensive project uh, knowledge bases, uh, uh, sophisticated project modeling technologies, and, and rich reports so that you can get out of the model uh, different views of your of your cost estimate. I want to say another word about knowledge bases here for those of you who may not be real familiar with knowledge bases, uh, but it's a quick way of getting the model up and running. Uh, you don't have to know everything all the inputs to a project to actually get started on an estimate. As long as you know basically what it is we're doing here, are we, are we estimating a, uh, a battery or some optics or, or a spacecraft structure or an airplane or a ship, uh, you tell the model what your, your uh, application is, you tell it how you plan to acquire uh, uh, the thing that you're estimating. Are you going to make it in-house or are you going to subcontract out part of it? Are you going to be modifying a design that you've already done, already done in the past and modifying that for a different, different uh, requirement? Uh, what is your life cycle? Are you going to be estimating development costs, production costs, operations costs, uh, any, any two of those or any one of those? You also tell it what standards you're going to be using. Is this a commercial project or is it a, a NASA project or a military project? So you tell, answer a few questions like that up front with any of our SEER models and it automatically populates most of the inputs with industry average type of data. So that's a really quick and nice way to get going on a project without having to uh, make a lot of inputs. And of course you can go back and modify any of those inputs that you that you need to as you proceed. So that's just a word about uh, about knowledge bases. We have clients returning back to this chart on the screen, we have clients in defense, aerospace, manufacturing, finance, insurance, and consulting. Uh, when I joined Galleries about three years ago, I was actually surprised to uh, see how many of our customers are in the financial and insurance business estimating software, mostly, uh, with Sear SIM. So that was kind of an eye-opening experience for me. Okay, uh, one quick chart on all our models, current, current Sear models. Uh, as I've already mentioned, Sear SIM is sort of the grandfather of them all, which is a software estimating model. Sear H has been around. It's not easy, as I've already, already said, to estimate system, heart systems and hardware and electronics. Uh, SEER IT uh, allows you to estimate information technology infrastructure, uh, the services, IT services that, were being, that are being provided and operating that uh, IT infrastructure. SEER for manufacturing is a very detailed model for estimating the manufacturing costs of pretty much any kind of device that you're thinking about building and manufacturing in large quantities. Um, CRH is uh, CRO, manufacturing is sensitive to all kinds of material selections, a wide range of uh, metallics uh, and composites, and all kinds of manufacturing processes, uh, including the latest uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing kind of processes. So it's a very sophisticated model. CR system was built for customers who kept wanting to bore down into just the systems engineering aspect of their estimate, do a better job of estimating 
systems engineering because for many disciplines and, and organizations in the world, uh, systems engineering is sort of one of the bigger slices of the pie in terms of uh, cost. And so uh, some customers are wanting a more detailed way of estimating systems engineering. And uh, you can integrate, by the way, any of the outputs from any of these models could be integrated back into CRH, for example, to have a composite model uh, that, that takes uh, inputs from all these other models and, and uh, collects it in one place. But what we're here to talk about today is the last one on the list, which is Sear Space, which is our <coughs> new product. And I will say Sear Space is a little different uh, than the others, uh, other gallery products in terms of Sear Space is dedicated to only one 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 regime, that of space. All our other models that are listed this, on this chart are more generic. Uh, it doesn't really matter what uh, what kind of business you're in, you can use all those models that are listed on the top part of the chart. Sear Space is totally dedicated to estimating space projects. Okay, a little bit more about Sear Space. Uh, <clears throat> why do we think you're going to be interested in using Sear Space? Well, to start off with, uh, uh, version one is the first release, and that is a NASA-centric model in terms of the data behind the model. However, we think it's applicable to pretty much anything any organization is doing in space. And why do I make that assertion? Well, because of the sub-bullets uh, on this chart, uh, all, such, all space projects use the same physics, for starters. Uh, all space projects pretty much use the same aerospace engineering processes. You see the same systems, the same subsystems and components in pretty much all space projects. And really when you go out and work with all kinds of organizations that are out there doing space projects, you find that they're very similar institutions. Uh, NASA, uh, NRO, Air Force, Navy, European Space Agency, French Space Agency, Italian Space Agency, even the Russian Space Agency. They're all pretty similar in the way they get things done. And so we think this model is going to be applicable to pretty much all users. And it's also got a rich set of uh, <clears throat> independent variables that will let you model uh, the distinctive aspects of whatever culture you're in. Uh, Sear Space includes cost drivers that are known to be good predictors of space projects. Some of them, most of them are quantitative. Quite a few, though, are also qualitative. And we proudly have the qualitative uh, 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 variables in the model because we believe that cost estimating is really a blend of art and science. And so if you don't have some of the more qualitative things in there, you're really not speaking to all the things that drive costs. So I'm talking about things like heritage, uh, technology readiness level, uh, the capability of your team, that sort of thing, when, I'm talking, when I mentioned qu quantitative variables. Sear space can be used in very early conceptual stages of the project life cycle, even before systems, even before SRR systems requirements are used, can be used even earlier than that in conceptual studies. And it can also be used up through at least PDR, and we think probably all the way to CDR, critical design review. And uh, early utility of the model is also supported by the knowledge bases that I've already mentioned. So you can estimate a project very, very early in its life cycle by using industry average uh, inputs on some of the things that have not yet been defined for your project, perhaps. Okay, this chart speaks to <clears throat> the differentiation between Sear Space, which we're principally talking about today, and Sear H and Sear Sim, which I know many of you are familiar with. So Sear H and Sear Sim are in the middle column there, with, and Sear Space in the right-hand side of the chart with some categories here, level of detail. Uh, those of you that have used Sear H, for example, know that you really almost need to mail a master equipment list, uh, certainly a very detailed mass statement uh, to be able to make full use of Sear H. And sometimes that doesn't come along until, you know, getting close to preliminary design review. Uh, Sear Space will happily operate or does happily operate at a higher level of the work breakdown structure. It oper operates at the subsystem level and, and the instruments that may be on the spacecraft. Uh, <clears throat> instruments uh, is the word that NASA uses. Payload is a more generic DOD term. Mission equipment, whatever, whatever, your, uh, whatever your terminology is. But it, oper it estimates both the supporting bus spacecraft and whatever the mission equipment is in terms of instruments or sensors or whatever. Um, Sear H work breakdown structure really only addresses about three of the elements of the NASA work breakdown structure, and I'll be showing you a, a, a graphic of that in just a moment. But that's uh, one through well one through six of the group, and then and then element ten, uh, where element ten is the systems integration and testing. 
The, NASA, uh, the search for space estimates every element of the NASA work breakdown structure. Now I want to put an asterisk on that, because uh, Eric will mention this when he does a demo. We don't quite have uh, the launch vehicle CER working yet, uh, which is uh, in the NASA nomenclature of WBS-8, and we're still working on operations. So version one uh, won't, won't do uh, launch operations quite yet. Our, our um, um, launch systems are the last complete life cycle in terms of operations, but we're very close to having those CERs completed. So version 1.1 1 .1 will be coming along with that in there, I think, pretty soon. Applicability, uh, CIRH and SIM both are more generic. As I've already mentioned, they operate uh, on all kinds of space and non-space projects. Any kind of project you're doing, uh, uh, CIRH and SIM can be applied to the hardware and software of that project. CIR space is just applicable to NASA, to uh, space projects such as NASA's Class A, B, and C projects, A, B, C, D uh, standards, uh, technology readiness levels are addressed. Uh, whether the project is an uh, Earth orbiting um, uh, spacecraft or going to deep space. And if it is going to deep space, uh, the model is sensitive to variations in the cost between the orbiters and flybys and landers and rovers. The database behind uh, CRH and SIM is very varied and wide. Uh, 20 years of corporate data collecting uh, is behind those two models. Plus, we have a lot of uh, subject matter experts. Some of which, some of them inside our company, and some we've hired as consultants to help us with our CERs and CER H and CER SIM. CER space is based on recent missions drawn from the NASA Cadre database, as well as some additional data sources um, that we have in, internal to Gallup, and then a lot of extensive research by Gallup on the NASA Cadre uh, uh, data points. As an example of that, I'll just mention that those of you who are users of the NASA Cadres may have noticed that. A lot of projects don't divide the cost between non-recurring and recurring uh, because NASA usually builds one-off kind of uh, uh, missions. So we've had to go and do research into how to, how to divide the cost between non-recurring and the production cost because we wanted to develop a CER and we wanted a production CER separately. So we've, got, we've done over a year's worth of research and untangling that sort of stuff that's um, behind the scenes in this model. The CERs and CRH and SIM were uh, derived using various methods over the years. Uh, all of CIR space has been done with regression analysis, and Dr. Smart will be talking more about that uh, in a few minutes, and including how he's used cross-validation to build the very best CERs that we can. Okay, here's that NASA work breakdown structure that I mentioned. Uh, I won't go through this, but some of you may be familiar with it. So CIR space, uh, this chart says, we'll estimate all 11 of those elements up there. I've already said that phase E and, and launch vehicles are lagging behind behind just a bit. We'll have that very soon. Also, we're mapping, the, the model lets you map to um, uh, mill standard 881D uh, for those of you who are in the Department of Defense. So we think the model uh, addresses both work breakdown structures. Uh, it allows for the counting of hardware contributions from, from uh, another entity. Uh, that's more of a NASA thing also because lots of NASA missions have uh, uh, foreign uh, partners contributing hardware and that gets to be a, a bit of a complex thing to model properly, but the model, model does a lot of work to help you on that. Uh, supports the analysis of different means of acquisitions, such as competed versus directed projects. Uh, is a prime contractor doing the, th doing the project or leading the project, or uh, is it a university built? Are there foreign contributions and all kinds of other considerations the model takes all of into account? It also uh, assesses heritage benefits. Uh, is the thing we're doing a major modification or a minor, minor modification of something that's been done before? And what is the technology readiness level of the uh, basic underlying hardware being used? Uh, the model lets you wrestle with that uh, <clears throat> common problem. Okay, CIR space allows you to create rough order of magnitude estimates with only a few high-level inputs uh, based on the knowledge bases that I've already discussed. So for example, there's applications knowledge bases there, and I took the opportunity on this chart to show you the bus rolled out there on the right-hand uh, graphic. So the spacecraft bus is estimated uh, by those subsystems that, the, that you see listed there, structural, structural and mechanical subsystems, thermal control subsystems, uh, the usual suspects, things that you're used to seeing. And you get a little bit of a view there, uh, some of the underlying uh, variables that uh, some of them are binary uh, switches where you throw a switch if you've got uh, oh active versus thermal um, active versus passive thermal control for example. 
the, it, the, the model separately estimates instruments. I'm not showing uh, Christian Smart. We'll talk about that in more de detail in just a moment. Uh, the, the types of instruments that the model takes into account. Uh, because, and, and telescopes are really instruments, okay, but telescopes are quite often such a big cost driver that will give you the ability to break out your telescope into a separate entity. Now, if your instrument has a lot of optics in it, you may choose to leave the optics in the instrument. But if you want to, you can you can estimate a telescope as an optical telescope assembly. Data processing units are something that are that need special attention too, in our opinion. Sometimes DPUs uh, uh, operate several instruments, take care of the data coming from several uh, pieces of mission equipment on a spacecraft, and sometimes each payload has its own DPU. Okay, so you need to be you need that flexibility to be able to go either way there. And here for space lets you do that. Another thing we think is more and more common uh, on spacecraft and, and pretty expensive and complicated and needed to be broken out as cryocoolers. So you'll see cryocoolers as a separate CER in sphere space. Okay, I think I've already talked about the things on the bottom of this chart. Uh, I think this is the point where I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Smart and let him uh, talk to you more about the cost estimating relationships behind the, behind the model. Hello. I'm going to talk to you about the um, first start with the instrument applications uh, k-bases and one of the nice things I like about that is uh, the, the wide variety of applications I think it uh, you know as Joe mentioned on his previous chart I think it makes it uh, uh, more applicable um, to uh, you know just outside of NASA as Joe said they you are know, primarily based on NASA data but we have a lot of instruments that are applicable to DOD missions based on my experience working in the Department of Defense especially the laser applications if you look on the lower left uh, the altimeters the lidars the optical transceivers so so those also make it um, applicable uh, even even just based on NASA data to, to DOD missions so there's a wide variety of things that you can you, know, you can use and you can apply the model to in terms of payloads an important part of of, um, of data is data data collection, uh, and and that was a big part of this project and in developing this tool. You know, data is the foundation of cost assessments. You look at the pyramid there on the right. Data is basically the foundation for everything. Based on that, you build your ground rules assumptions and you do your analysis based on that, and then the end result of that is a cost estimate. There's been a lot of research done on, on data and how much data you need, and, and uh, researchers at Google found that simple models based on a lot of data are better than more elaborate models based on less data. We, we need sound quantitative data, not just cost, but we also need technical and programmatic. And, you know, we as analysts, we, we like to spend a lot of time working on tools and techniques. That is sometimes the fun part of our job, but the most important focus really should be on the quality and the quantity of the data. And you know, data normalization applied to this project for some older missions um, that we adjusted to account for full cost accounting, uh, not all the older NASA missions. We use recent cadres, but those that are more recent that are, that are uh, older than about you know, 15 years ago uh, didn't, didn't include the, the government oversight costs. That's, that's, that's what we I mean by full cost accounting. So we had to adjust for that. Uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, we had to do some research and in, in displaying the data into non-recurring and recurring costs for the cases that we have multiple units. We normalize costs to a constant base year using NASA inflation guidance. And when we had multiple units, we had to normalize the recurring costs to a theoretical first unit cost. And then the, the data in the CERs that we include in here, uh, SEER space include, we, have, we developed new cost estimating relationships, uh, which I'll refer to as CERs, for the bus and for the instruments, including dedicated CERs for optical telescopes and data processing units. And uh, again, that's based on uh, NASA data. Um, and we assume that the data for the Earth orbiting and the planetary missions can be used together. Um, and basically, you can use a, a dummy variable, you know, aka a, a binary indicator variable to account for the differences in the model. Uh, the bus systems are based on over it's over 50 recent Earth orbiting and planetary missions, and the instrument CERs are based on uh, even more data than that. Okay, the CER development, um, you know, the, the oldest method still in common use for developing what we call power form CERs are equations like y equals ax raised to the b. Uh, the most common method is to do log transform ordinary least squares, LOLS. 
uh, it's been criticized many years for a lot of reasons. The, the transformation causes the equation to be optimal for log dollars. We don't spend log dollars, we spend actual dollars, and the result is bias. Uh, when we transform it back to uh, linear space, we're estimating the median instead of the mean. There are some other methods, such as MUPI and ZIMPI, that are recommended as alternatives, but we do the, I've, I've kind of analyzed the the errors or the residuals of spacecraft CERs, the log normal is the best fit. And it turns out that the log normal is the, uh, when the log normal is the best fit for the residuals, that the log transform ordinary least squares has some optimal properties. And so to take advantage of that, we I developed a new method um, to, it uses maximum likelihood estimation to uh, make it optimal and to avoid the whole transformation issue. So. It is a computer-based method. You can't do it by hand anymore, but nobody really develops CERs by hand anymore anyway. So um, just like MUPI and ZIMPI, uh, you just have to use solver to, um, to, to, to maximize, to optimize the equation. So, um, you know, it's important that we, that we do, uh, I mean, be rigorous in our statistical techniques. Uh, you know, George Box, famous statistician, once said all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, he also added to that statement and said that, you know, it's a question of how wrong does a model have to be before it is not useful. And um, as the, another statistician, David Cox, said, there are no routine statistical questions. There are only questionable statistical routines. Okay, and then, um, like I said, we use the power equation for most of the subsystems of the instruments. That's worked very well for us. We, we have used, basically, started by that form. That's, that worked well in this case. It's used this has worked well for us in practice in the past. We have uh, multiple variables for all the CERs. Um, typically, it's a nonlinear form, but in a few cases where the system cost is low, such as data processing units, where those are only a few million dollars, uh, the range in variation is not high enough to, to warrant a log transform, so we use a linear equation. And then the model inputs that we talk about, so we talked about multivariate equations, so we have multiple inputs. Uh, you know, we use weight, we use heritage, and then we also have some other parameters, some programmatic parameters. Uh, you know, AO, which is an announcement opportunity, which is, means competed, competed or directed, Earth orbiting planetary, number of sponsors, uh, international involvement. You know, if there's an international uh, organization involved, it's, it tends to increase the cost. The amount of testing, the, that you know, more since we test a, a system, the more it costs. The number of instruments, uh, which were in part of the bus CERs, and, and the design life. Uh, the longer the design life, the longer it tends to cost. It uh, spe especially affects the uh, power subsystem, which can affect uh, uh, you know the number of batteries or the power of the batteries that you need. And and the. Uh, the, all, this, all the CERs included power as a driver except for telescopes, and telescopes are a little unique in that we don't, uh, typically not driven or not associated strongly with weight, but rather with uh, mirror diameter as their, their primary uh, cost variant. In addition to the common factors, there are several CERs. We included unique technical independent variables, like I said, with telescopes, uh, mirror diameter, and for bus subsystems, you know, each subsystem is going to be a little bit different. Uh, for example, uh, structures, uh, the number of deployables and the deployable complexity, uh, you know, that, that's unique to structures. The type of thermal control, whether it's passive or active. Uh, the, the CCMD8, which is the communications and command data handling subsystem, the number of bands, and there's some other things you can read there. The GNC, which is the guidance navigation control, also called attitude control. It has some unique technical factors there, power and reaction control. And in terms of uh, you know selecting variables, like I said, the primary CER variable is weight. Uh, it's not really a causative driver. We're not really have a cost driver model per se. It's merely uh, things that are associated and are correlated with costs and things that are available early in the program's life cycle that we can use to estimate costs. Um, and, and like I said, we use heritage, and that's a controversial topic. Um, uh, the use of uh, subjective parameters like heritage or, you know, reciprocal, which is percent new design. Um, but we've always found that the amount of new design uh, is strongly correlated with the non-recurring cost of the program. It's typically overrated early in the program's life cycle by the program. That could lead to underestimation if you are using optimistic values. 
And it's also subjective, so that can lead to some misestimation issues. But, um, but we found that, you know, really there's a need by customers to discern the impact of new design on cost. So, so we've included it as a parameter. And one other thing I want to mention is uh, cross-validation. So one of the issues that we often face, we have a, uh, some issues with limited data sets. You know, we talked about how many data points we have. Or, uh, compared to some other government systems, we have a little bit of a luxury of data points, but, but really there's still a small number of uh, data points when using regression modeling. Um, so, you know, we have to be a little bit careful in not to overfit to the sample. Um, you know, uh, Nate Silver, uh, you know, has, has stated that uh, overfitting is the most common scientific problem you've never heard of. It's, it's easy to do. It, uh, with, you can, it's a natural tendency to do it. If overfitting, you know, basically is a confusion of signal with noise. Um, you tend to overfit the equation or the data so much that you're, you're fitting some of the noise, and, and that is not a pattern that's going to replicate. So you're, you're not going to generalize well when you use it outside the sample. So. Uh, we want to try to avoid that, and and uh, the tendency is to to get a good R squared and, and a you know, high R squared and a low standard error, and uh, you know on the sample, and that makes it makes them all look good on the sample, but then it doesn't generalize well because of the tendency to overfit. So, uh, what to avoid that? What we did, we used something called cross validation, where we we split the um, data set into you know uh, in different partitions. We would then fit the data on n minus one of those partitions, and then examine the fit on the piece that we left out. We do that n times. Typically, uh, depends on the size of the data set. Typically, does five or six times five-fold validations. We have five partitions. We fit the data across the different partitions. Um, we so then we have five different equations, five different assessments of fits, and we average those equations, sort of an ensemble type technique. To get the overall equation, so um, this has been proven to help uh, avoid overfitting and to improve generalization. If you look at the graph there on the, the right, as as models get more complex, they they and that's the x-axis. The y-axis is model error. As the models get more complex, they do better and better on the training set, but they do better. They start to do better on the the uh, validation set, but as you increase the complexity past a certain point. And that error tends to increase. So that's that's the uh, that's the overfitting. When that that green curve, when that you start moving back up along that curve, you, you tend to overfit. So that's basically my part of the charts. There's also a chart here just on we do we do uh, some uh, cost estimation on uh, you know you know a workshop for doing space cost estimation. There's some information about that there. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put this uh, contact slide up here, and then I'll turn it over to Eric Sick, who's gonna do a uh, demonstration of the model. All right, thank you, Christian. So we heard about some of the features and capabilities of CR for Space. So now let's explore what those look like within the model itself. SEER uh, for Space, uh, while it is a system or subsystem level model compared to other SEER models, the organizational layout is still very similar. So in our top two fields here, you will see our WBS outline to the left, and then our parameter inputs field to the right. In the bottom side of our screen, to the left, we'll have our report, our output reports, and to the right, we will have our charts. For this particular example, we have a medium explorer mission for which we have the summary outputs displayed here in our quick estimate report. If we go over to our chart, over to the right, we can scroll over individual categories to see the total cost, as well as the percentage total cost of those individual elements. However, if we want to see greater granularity of detail in these costs, we can navigate to our detailed estimate, 
our detailed system estimate. And so now we see a detailed breakdown of all system level activities which are occurring at this top level element. We have our mission level system costs, including mission level program management, systems engineering, etc., as well as those activities which occur at the payload level. So we have payload management, payload systems engineering, etc. If we scroll down to the bottom, here we see the summation of hardware elements, our subsystem total, including all of the spacecraft bus costs, our instrument costs and our instrument support system costs, our telescopes, our DPUs, and our cryocoolers, as well as any additional items. If we want a further breakdown of these subsystem totals, we can then navigate to the subsystem detail report to find the individual system level costs which occur at each element, our bus specific program management, systems engineering, as well as for those of the instruments and the instrument support systems as well as the hardware costs, including the spacecraft bus individual subsystems. So our structural mechanical subsystems, thermal control subsystems, et cetera. If we want to view the cost of individual instruments, we can go to our WBS specific output and look to the WBS total cost. Here we have the breakdown by element as listed in our WBS outline, and we can see the individual cost for each of our instruments, both development and production. But what are these elements? What elements can super space capture? Well, if we look to the left-hand side, we'll see a list of all of the different elements that can be modeled by super space. At the top, we have the roll-up, our organizational uh, elements and where we also capture the different types of system level costs, whether they be at the payload level or at the mission level. Then we have our hardware elements, our spacecraft bus, our instruments, and our instrument support system, the spacecraft bus element, where we capture all of the hardware costs for the individual spacecraft bus subsystem, as well as spacecraft bus specific, PMS, CMA, and IAMT. You can choose to, as modeled here, capture the individual spacecraft bus subsystems with an element, or you can capture the entirety of the spacecraft bus by selectively turning on and off cost for individual spacecraft bus subsystems. Starting from the top for our structures and mechanisms spacecraft bus subsystem, we have this program description inputs. As Dr. Smart described, these are the programmatic things which are defined at the top level for the mission. So something like mission design life, production quantity, you can set these at the top and you can set lower level items to inherit these values or to inherit the multiple of those values. Then we have our element specific system level inputs, so our PM, SE, MA, INT. And then our system level uh, technical inputs. So the things which define the actual parameters of that system itself. For our structures and mechanisms spacecraft bus subsystem, we have the number of active instruments and passive instruments, the level of qualification testing, as well as the generic mass, new development percentage, and technology complexity inputs. And then we have uh, structural and mechanical subsystem specific inputs for the number of deployables, as well as the deployable complexity. We navigate to a different spacecraft bus subsystem, such as for thermal control. We see that the common inputs are the same, the mass, the development percentage, technology complexity, and the subsystem specific input has changed to now reflect the thermal control system type, the method of heat rejection, whether the system is acid or actively cooled. Scrolling down, we have additional parameter inputs for you to further define your system. You have the technology maturation required where you can turn on or off additional technology maturation effort for that specific element, as well as you can define the extent of contributions to that specific element. Then you have the ability to insert additional items specific to that element, change the confidence level of estimation for that element, as well as change various engineering inputs for that element. 
Moving on to instruments, you see that the input layout is very similar as it was for the bus. You have your programmatic inputs, you have your system level inputs, and then you have your element level technical inputs. These element technical level inputs are going to be slightly different for some of the spacecraft bus. Um, I'm sorry, for some of the instrument support systems. For the DPU, it is identical to the instruments. You have mass, power, new development percentage, the qualification test level, and the technology complexity. However, for our telescope elements, you can see the addition of the mirror diameter parameter. And for our cryo coolers, you can see the cryocooler type input as well as the temperature input. But that's not the entire picture. As um, I believe Joe said, we have the knowledge base capability within SEER space, which allows you to pre-populate a number of these parameter input fields. If I navigate to the knowledge base input field, here we have the various types of knowledge base categories and the input selected for this element. As we mentioned earlier, we have the application knowledge base, platform, heritage, standard, organization, as well as an empty knowledge base category, which is left up to the user to define. If I were to, for example, add an additional instrument to this particle instrument suite, I would navigate to the insert element option to input an instrument element type. And I see that we have a high energy particle detector and an ion detector. So I'm going to add a low energy particle detector to complement the suite. The first thing I do is I go select the appropriate application knowledge base. If I'm unsure as to the most applicable knowledge base selection, I can navigate to the help specific to that knowledge base category and find the selection which most closely matches the technology that I'm trying to capture. In this instance, I believe the closest match is the dust detector particle instrument. Happy with that selection, I will navigate down through the drop down list and find the dust detector. Next, we have the platform knowledge base category. As this instrument is mounted on a small satellite, I will select small satellite. Then we have the heritage of the instrument. We will say that this particular instrument requires major modifications from heritage. Next, we have the standard or classification level to which the instrument will be held. This particular mission is going to be held to a class C standard. So that's what I will select. Finally, the last knowledge base category is the organizational relationships, management structure, and the process through which this particular element will be procured. As this mission is procured through a competed contract, and the responsible party for this element is a university or university-affiliated organization, I will select the competed contract, university, knowledge base. Now that I'm happy with all of my knowledge base selections, I will confirm. And our new instrument element will be inserted into our WBS. And we can see that the overwhelming majority of parameter inputs have been filled out for us based on our knowledge base selection. The only two absent parameter inputs are mass and power. For now, I will just input a few values for the selection. And once these two fields are filled out, we now have a completed estimate for our new instrument type. However, maybe the addition of this new instrument might require additional uh, advanced maturation efforts. To capture this maturation effort, I will turn on the technology maturation required parameter. And I'm now presented with these technology improvement complexity setting. I can navigate through this help to find out the overall system level complexity of maturing this technology. 
But if I want more specific breakdown of the types of effort involved in advancing this technology, I can navigate to this technology maturation penalty calculator. When we first navigate to the technology maturation calculator, the first selection we must make is the appropriate work element type. In this instance, we are capturing the maturation of an instrument element. So we navigate down to the drop down to select the instrument element type. Next, we're prompted with the complexity settings for a variety of different criteria for maturing this particular technology. In order, we have the percentage of modified components coming into this system, the immaturity of those components, the difficulty of maturing those components, and the impact of maturing those components on the overall schedule for development for this system. Next, we have the immaturity of the heritage system. The complexity in adapting the heritage system to this new application. And the complexity of the interface between the heritage system and these new components. For additional detail in determining the appropriate complexity settings for any of these different criteria, we can expand these fields to find help specific to these individual criteria. Once we have confirmed all of the individual complexity settings for all of the criteria, we are presented with an overall summary of the system level complexity for improving this technology, as well as what we call the proxy TRL. In this instance, this particular instrument is a majority of way through the maturation process from TRL4 to TRL5. Now that we've confirmed all of our input settings, we can copy our inputs to import them into our model directly. Go over to my model and paste them directly into the model itself. And when I do so, I am also pasting in a comment which contains the inputs that I put into the calculator itself. So there is a reference to the inputs that I made prior. So now, when I go to our cost by WBS, I can see the incremental cost of turning on to technology maturation. So 650K before, and that's 860 after. If I were to say, um, improve the, uh, or require technology maturation for multiple instruments, say for this entire suite, because I'm adding this new instrument in, I can choose to turn on technology maturation for all of these elements. And then when I go to the suite level, I can see the incremental cost of technology maturation for all of these elements. If I navigate to the mission level or the top level rollup, I can see how these costs and this particular um, payload suite then cascade up to the mission level. Uh, I'm going to leave some additional time for questions because it seems like we have a few at this point. So this is where I will stop the general demonstration. Uh, if any of these questions that follow uh, are e detailed in the model itself, I can go back and can capture whatever your question entails. So with that, I'm going to have Dr. Hamburger take over the screen once more. All right. Thank you. 